Thank you, Gavin. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, oh, thanks for turning up today. Let's see how, well, let's see where this takes us anyway. Um, although I am obviously uh, ultimately in charge of the insect collections at Natural History Museum, um, I have a massive bias towards wasps, particularly if you monitor wasps. So there'll be a few examples of those in here. Um, but yeah, I am incredibly lucky uh, to be in charge of that. This amazing collection of about, well, we also like to say about 27 million specimens in the museum, but who knows? I suppose part of this talk will indeed be about uh, you know, what, why and how can Amazon Atlas help in a you know, big science project like Darwin Tree of Life, but also really how uh, it will touch upon how people, how a huge body of naturalists have built up those collections and what we're doing with them now. And it partly being an excuse for me to roam around some subjects that I particularly enjoy. But um, let's see what the next slide is. Yeah, but, so, but the Darwin Tree of Life project, what's it all about? I mean, ultimately, this is uh, to sequence the genomes of all UK eukaryotes. Um, so what that is, um, you know, the genome is essentially the the entire genetic code that um, that that encodes for an organism, and that is quite a large bit of DNA, some very large molecules sometimes, and this pilot phase that we're in at the moment for the Darwin Tree of Life, we're aiming to sequence the genomes, the entire genetic code of about 2,000 species. And this covers uh, sort of animals, plants, fungi, um, various protist groups, um, so which are single-celled organisms. So there's quite a huge variety of life. And uh, it's quite, you know, we can do that within the UK um, because partly because we know our fauna and flora quite well and we know how to identify things quite well although we'll come on to that in a bit how we don't know everything at all and but also the UK you know it's we have some amazing expertise here we have the Sanger Centre who are involved in sequencing the human genome and we have even though it's you know this little island off the northwest coast of Europe which gets a bit cold and damp uh, we do have an awful lot of of life here we've got a huge variety of the sort of num of the families of animals plants fungi etc can be found just here within fairly easy reach of some laboratories so it is a great place to do that uh, to go and sequence a good representative suite of genomes across all of life but how are we going to do this obviously you don't set out to do this just by yourself even if you're the natural history museum or you're the sanger center it's, it requires, you know, quite a network of partners. We've got 10 key partners at the moment who, who have funding for this, but and various other partners who are helping us. And really, these are a collection of, sort of people who do uh, the collections, like the Natural History Museum, like the uh, Kew Gardens, like the World Botanic Gardens Edinburgh and the Marine Biological Association. But also it's people who do the hardcore sort of sequencing and the bioinformatics, the the you know, the assembly of all that DNA into a genome that's of use and that has genes uh, highlighted and that sort of stuff. So yes, yeah, big collaboration. At the moment, it was, just only, it was only funded for about two and a half years, an initial sort of trial run by the Wellcome Trust, it was very generous of them. And we're producing these genomes uh, for, like I said, about 2000 species. And these aren't just, you know, here's a big string of DNA. This is all the DNA of an organism uh, allocated to the chromosomes uh, as far as possible, and then mapping genes onto that as far as, as far as possible as well. So it's really complex. I won't go into it much because I don't understand it. Um, I'm the sort of person who identifies the wasps and tries to coordinate the sampling of various insects. And look, thankfully, I'm not the person who, um, who has to actually uh, interpret all that DNA. But yeah, we're trying to collect about 900 families of all sorts of organisms at the moment and get those sequenced and also have in the bank about 8,000 species ready for the next phase of the project. So we're really busy. It's a very busy summer already. Uh, last year was very hectic. Um, of course, uh, one of the big things about this trial project is to gain expertise in collecting, identifying, and sequencing these genomes of all sorts of organisms. Um, so we spent a lot of time, uh, we spent quite a lot of time just working out how to do it. How do you go from a specimen in the field to a big genome sequence? And how, particularly at the beginning of the project, how do you do this in a pandemic? Uh, 
which was real challenge, obviously. So it certainly set us back a lot, but we're catching up time. And just to put this in context, Darwin Tree of Life, um, sequencing these genomes, this is built off the back of technology that came out of the Human Genome Project. And this cost of about $2.7 billion over 13 years. It was a massive uh, venture. And, you know, they've, they've actually only just finished it um, in getting the last bit of the, um, last bit of the chromosome, um, the last bit of the genome published this year. But it's funded for 13 years from 1990. And Darwin Tree of Life aims to take that a step, uh, step into the distance, really. It's not just one species, it's a 2,000 species, and we're trying to do it in three years, and we're doing it for an awful lot less than 2.7 billion. Uh, the actual grant we have from the Wellcome Trust is for a little under, just under 10 million pounds. So we're trying to do this on the, on the cheap almost, although I could never say that 10 million pounds is on the cheap, but it's a different scale uh, of cost reduction. Uh, so, so far we've had about, I think, uh, just over 100 genomes have been published uh, here's a selection of some lovely species for which we have now UK genomes. Uh, and this, there's a big bias, as you'll see from this picture, there's quite a bias towards Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, uh, especially because uh, in the early stages of collecting, when we had lockdown, uh, the White and Woods crew were just collecting like mad in White and Woods with light traps, loads of moths went into the system. We've got some iconic species uh, sequenced, such as the common toad um, and uh, a lovely brown uh, brown rat. You know, this is quite a variety. We've got some uh, in the middle there behind 100 genomes is some little um, weird parasite of birds. You know, there's, there's quite a variety of things. And this, is, this variety is increasing all the time. What does it mean to publish a genome? Um, essentially, this is, uh, each genome it basically is a huge, it, in one, uh, the most important aspect in many respects is this huge data dump, um, masses of data on uh, these, on all the DNA, how it's divided up into chromosomes, where the genes are on that, on those chromosomes. And this is publicly available. As soon as these things are assembled, they're publicly available for anybody in the world to use. But each genome is also accompanied by a short paper in Welcome Open Research. And this, this is a typical paper, we call them genome notes. It basically, for all those who are really into things, there's a little paper, you get a small picture of the organism that now um, has been crushed up, and I'll come on to that a bit later. Some really interesting stats for those who are into it about the, um, the scaffolds, uh, the sort of in the lengths of all the individual bits of DNA that were sequenced, how, so it gives you an idea of the quality of the genome, You've got some interesting chart here, which they look like abstract works of art, really. This is a, basically a chromosome map. It's, it's, it's showing you how all, the di how all the DNA of this little wasp um, can be lumped together into putative chromosomes. Um, it's all quite fun stuff. Uh, and for me, this is really interesting. This little wasp here is Ichneumon xanthorius. It's a fairly common Ichneumonid wasp. Many people see it and catch it. Uh, but it's the first genome for this entire family Ichneumonidae. So that's the sort of level of need that is out there for people who really need a genome for a group of organisms. It's really limiting so far. You know, Ichneumonidae is a group with two and a half thousand species just in the UK, um, somewhere in the region of 60,000 species at least in the world at large. This is the first time a genome for a species had been produced. And in this first draft, they've also allocated, they've managed to identify 11,000 genes for this wasp. So there's a huge amount of new information pumped out there. Um, the important, each genome note is not just a sort of technical report on this, on the DNA, on the genome. It's also a chance to put a little bit of background information in. Um, so there's a bit about what is this organism? Why is it interesting that we have a genome for it? What do they do? Uh, and this is one of the great areas where people, people can contribute a lot. So it's somebody who sends a specimen, who has a collector specimen, and the person who IDs that specimen, it's often the same person, but it could be two different people, the collector and the identifier. They're both listed as authors on that, on that paper. So there's an acknowledgement of the fact that you know, we couldn't have done this without these individuals. Then the collector, the, the collector is first offered the chance to actually write an introduction. So this is a great opportunity for people who are into uh, you know, the natural history of all of UK organisms to contribute to the project in terms of 
putting a bit of context around these these genome notes. Uh, and in fact, there's so many moth genomes coming out at the moment that uh, there's a bit of a there's a call online for people who might want to write the introductions to genome notes. Please contribute. And some great uh, opportunities for for undergraduates and universities at the moment as well. So yeah, I mean, basically, so that's one of the ways that people contribute. People supply specimens, identify them, get uh, get their names on a paper uh, as they should. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's kind of. But I just want to go on to the actual specimens for a little bit. Just this this is one of these really exciting delivery. This is really how the specimens end up a lot of the time. This is some dry ice pellets. And here's some really exciting little cryovials. These little tubes are ridiculously expensive, uh, but they've got nice barcodes on them and they survive being frozen down to minus 200 degrees centigrade. If you need, this is how a lot of our specimens end up for Darwin Tree of Life. And it's quite um, a step from there to, um, yeah, from the sort of natural history side of things, going out into the field, to these little vials and associated data. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and whiz you through that a bit. Um, but what we achieved so far at Darwin Tree of Life, um, and particularly at the Natural History Museum, and I, I'm putting this in really because we've just been collating all of our, all of our figures for, um, for a report to welcome, and I haven't actually got access to the uh, figures for the other institutes at the moment, but I do have the hours, and we can see that, uh, and this figure's already risen because that was last week but 4255 uh, specimens have been frozen so far and each one of those identified and most of those specimens have been their identification have been verified by dna barcoding which i'll mention in a minute we've already sent to sanger over a thousand specimens of 644 species mostly insects but also some vertebrates uh, some nice uh, marine invertebrates as well of various different groups We've established these methods for how we collect and identify things and how we process them for the cold chain. The cold chain is an important process. Once a specimen is collected for Darwin Tree of Life, we freeze it down to at least minus 80 degrees, degrees centigrade and it can't thaw out because we want that DNA to be preserved in really long chains, in really long lengths of DNA. So we're collecting, we're finding new ways of collecting essentially, you know, out in the field, but then being able to get things deep frozen. Uh, back, to, back to the museum and identified alive. So it's, real, it's a really nice challenge. And we're creating a UK biobank, essentially. Uh, there's already lots of biobanking initiatives. This is adding a lot more species to our, our sort of UK biobank. It's not just the vertebrates at the moment. We're collecting species of everything that we can get hold of. And this is some people in action. Um, so, you know, traditionally we go out with the light traps, sweep nets, you know, all that really not very sophisticated means these traditional means of collecting in this case insects or herbarium samples whatever it's absolutely the same sort of process that you would always you always go out and collect things it's building on a huge amount of knowledge in the community of collectors but then uh the specimens drop like magic into the machine you know these actually get dropped into quite a complicated and labor intensive pathway where the specimens are frozen they're photographed frozen on dry ice they're carefully put into these individual little vials and the data recorded and that's associated with um, DNA further down the line. Uh, but we do still get to have fun in the field. Uh, I have no idea why I put that picture in except that um, I just love the fact, yeah, this is what entomologists look like. If you give them free reign, they just build bigger and bigger nets. Uh, this is Vlad, one a ditrist colleague, collecting little fungus gnats. He's collecting little fungus gnats. They're terribly difficult to identify. We're, we're working out how we do this, how we identify them alive, and then get them sequenced. It's great fun. Um, and of course, this is done. We don't do it just by ourselves. You know, even though there's ten partners, just by ourselves, we don't have all the expertise to do all this collecting and all this identifying. And um, we rely massively on a huge network of uh, naturalists and I've just put some of our biggest collaborators so far up here um, so like we piggyback on things like Ditris Forum field meetings, the British Myriapod and Isopod group, uh, we go along with them, the British Arachnological Society have been amazing at getting us particular spiders that we need, uh, the Coleoptera Society of, Great, of Britain and Ireland which just launched, they're already inviting us on their first inaugural sort of field trip to Wales and of course you know the our government partners, you've got Nature Scarf, Natural England, CFAS, these sort of agencies 
or given up given us you know use of na national nature reserves uh time on vessels in the case of CFA, cfas uh, they've been brilliant at helping us because ultimately it's a huge collaboration and the expertise we need to do a project like this is scattered all over the place um and of course it's not just it's not just um it's not just these you know actual learning you know, societies it's also individual uh, amateur naturalists out there i just put a um a mummy so this is obviously this is biased towards wasps you can see a mummified caterpillar with an exit hole uh this is a fox moth but i've got uh, colleagues at the moment who are just um some really dedicated uh, naturalists who are sending me mummified caterpillars so that i can get the wasps that come out and potentially freeze them or and also set up cultures um so we're getting not only the wasp that parasitized this little moth we're also getting its hyperparasitoids the wasps that attack the other wasps we're getting a little network of species thanks to some people who know how to find these caterpillars which is great uh, even these big this big fancy wasp here rissa persuasoria uh, it's one of the biggest this is the biggest uk ichneumonid wasp this is sent in by an amateur naturalist again um and you know because he had access to the log piles i've got this wasp we put it in the freezer it's a really valuable thing to have because there's been a lot of research done on that so i'm you know really grateful so essentially naturally we rely on naturalists and expertise to know just particularly you know where are these species in the country um we can't just go we can't as the natural history museum team especially as the project goes on we can't go everywhere to collect everything we need all these people who know where to find the things and how to identify them and of course, this relies a lot on natural history knowledge. How, what do these things do? How do I go about collecting a few thousand species of wasps? Well, I would need to know a lot about their hosts, how to rear these things, and that will require a lot of collaboration. Uh, this is going to be more and more important as the project goes on, as we go into more and more obscure groups, and we need to tap into any specialist expertise that exists out there. Um, but another way that people are contributing a lot to this project um, already, and hopefully even more, is uh, through providing species that we can then DNA barcode. Um, and I do apologise if I go on about barcodes too much, but just to point out, we track specimens through a physical barcode, you know, QR code here, and a nine digit number. But we also rely on DNA barcodes, and this is just a 650 base pair fragment of a gene, a mitochondrial gene, cytochrome oxidase one. This we use as an identifier. Um, so technically, even if I smash that, even if that wasp gets sequenced uh, for all its DNA, we can hopefully, we take a leg off before that, we sequence that, and then we can verify the identification. That's exactly what I said it was, thankfully. Uh, well, I'll come on to that. But yeah, this DNA barcode acts as another identification verification. Um, so I just, it's just a random wasp there. Just to point out, these one. this is a wonderful little, um, quite big Braconid wasp new to Britain that we found thanks to uh, partners at Forest Research who sent these to me. Uh, and like many interesting wasps now, it has five legs, not six. Uh, one leg has gone in to these plates. There's, you've got rows and rows of legs here and a little bit of ethanol. They'll be ground up and producing um, CO1 DNA barcode sequences. And we use those to match uh, the specimens to the barcode to check, is it really what I said it was? Uh, this is for anybody who's interested in these lovely little species here, Natelia wasps. Um, this is a great example where I was verifying the identifications of these wasps that we were freezing and then found out, oh, that's actually two species. The DNA barcodes show there's two species that I've been confusing under one. Uh, and then you look at them carefully, actually got different head shapes, so I should have noticed that. But DNA barcoding is there. Uh, I won't go into accelerated species discovery, actually. We use barcodes a lot to, to um, to try and get a grip on the diversity of life out there. If you bark, what, what's the diversity of barcodes? Can you then match those to physical species? But it's not just going into the tropics. That was an example where I described a load of species, um, 27 new species in my student from uh, tropical South America. But I've got colleagues describing loads of new species from Europe, from Sweden. DNA barcoding is incredibly helpful for looking at, for finding differences between species. Um, and just for collecting the Darwin Tree of Life, we're discovering that things like this quite common little moth that you find in reed beds. There's supposed to be two moths in two species, in fact, but all the DNA barcodes are mixed up 
and are they really two different species? My colleague David is looking into this. Um, I think it's really cool, but that's just basically we do a lot of barcoding now to verify identifications. It's not the primary, it's not the identification because of its DNA barcode, it's just a helpful sign. And it's getting routine now. I collected this really dull brown moth. I thought it was the thing called Tracer, you know, Tracer Tinctella. DNA barcode shows, yes, I was right. So that's brilliant. But that wasp earlier that I showed, which I should know all about, I tried to identify it live in the field as a thing called Agrippon anxium. We got the DNA barcodes back and I'm pretty sure actually I was wrong. It's Agrippon varitarsum. They're very difficult to separate when they're alive. So we need these DNA barcodes as a backup tool. We also see lots of these barcode results. This is for matching on public databases. They're coming back as Agrippon spur because it's diff we still don't have quite a few species in this genus. We don't have good DNA barcodes for them. So we're trying to generate those. Uh, that's just the, I'll skip that one. So we're trying to get these good DNA barcodes so that we can then verify our identifications. And of course, there's loads of applications for DNA barcodes. Uh, you can do a lot more routine monitoring of sort of river systems, for example. Um, and there's been a lot of people concentrating on freshwater DNA for doing that. Um, and people who are contributing. So we're soliciting specimens now that we can sequence just this, you know, 650 base pairs as well. The 650 base pair DNA barcode. Those specimens can go into that trusty museum as a physical voucher of this identification. And the barcode then exists to try as a vouch as a reference to identify things molecularly. So it's really, really important. Um, but yeah, going back from the barcode, back up here to another scale to the entire genomes. Um, essentially, what happens to that specimen if you're sequence it, sequencing it for a genome? Here's some spectacular specimens from our collections in London at the Natural History Museum. Insects are amazing. Um, but sadly, the things that we're sequencing genomes you don't get a pretty picture like this because they get ground up into, into essentially dust, which is then sequenced. So those things are no longer accessible physically. I suppose it's an interesting question of what we want from a specimen. Ideally, you want it to be accessible for any particular future use, but you can't predict all the uses in the future. And you need to be able to retrieve as much information about that specimen as possible. So a specimen in a museum, it can never be everything that you'd ever want, I guess. You can have a beautiful pinned wasp like this, um, which can tell you an awful lot about form and function. Um, you've got an earwig wing like this. You know, I don't know, I'll just put these in because I happened to take a load of really nice photos a little while ago and I've got to find an excuse to put them into the slide, into talks. But they are beautiful things. Um, and essentially collections haven't changed that much over the centuries. This is from the about 1700, some specimens in boxes. Um, we pin them a lot more now. Uh, collections haven't changed much, but the storage has. We store them much better now. We make slide mounts, we store things in alcohol, but essentially the, the specimen has not changed an awful lot in a few hundred years. Until now, I would argue, there's a big new change. We've built this new collection and it's much less attractive. It's in a freezer. We've got, we've got little vials in boxes, in freezer compartments, kept at minus 80. These do not look great. Uh, but these, essentially, we're relying now. This is a great way to store things for huge, long lengths of DNA. It's not a great way to store specimens if you want to look at them later or if you want to make a nice photograph for an identification key. And when we said we've collected something like this, like this dotted bee fly, which I collected in lockdown in my garden, uh, I was very pleased to be sending that off for a genome. But, you know, what's what is the back? What is the voucher? What is the proof that this DNA sequence at the end of it is what I said it is the species that I said it was? I've got a little photo, which in the field, I just took with my phone through, through a tube, a leg got taken off for DNA barcoding, and that's it now. Sometimes like that dotted bee fly or like this beautiful Bombus muscorum, we're pretty confident of the identification. And we've got some great evidence, but Something like this little wasp, which this is an illustration of how we process specimens in the museum. This little wasp here looks like several other species of little wasp. And, you know, when it gets processed, the head gets chopped off, might be used for RNA. The thorax, the thorax gets chopped. That's got loads of DNA. The abdomen could be sent for a separate analysis. 
where they sequence the gut contents. Legs get removed for barcoding. There's not going to be a lot left of that wasp. Um, here's another little wasp. Sorry, all these wasp examples. But this was a great thing that we collected in Scotland on one of our field trips. I thought it was something. Um, we got it sequenced. The barcode said it's Plectiscus caligulus, new to Britain. That's great. But um, the specimen is going to be ground into dust. And all that we're going to have left of that is a bit of DNA. Um, I will point out as well, it's not just, it's not all bad news. Bad news. The fact that this came back as a, a different species to what I said it, it was meant I went back to our collection of pinned insects, all those vouchers that have been put in the collection over the last couple of hundred years. And I found more specimens of this from Britain. So it's always, as you all know, it's incredibly important to have voucher specimens in collections. Uh, because you never know what sort of uses there will be for these old specimens. This is just a nice example of a student's work. She's now doing a PhD. This is her master's project. It's an amazing project. But she looked at collections of hornets in our, in our museum and more recent data and could re and just using some really fancy modeling techniques, she could get around all these gaps in data, you know, like the years when nobody collected a hornet or the bits of the country that people haven't looked collected in very often and get a really robust idea that hornet populations decreased, increased again, decreased again, and now on the increase again. Got a great pattern. You can go back to the old collections and get these and find out a lot about how things have changed. As you know, you know, insects are emerging at different times now compared to 100 years ago or even less, 50 years ago. They're also changing their shape. This is a butterfly where males are getting smaller it's really interesting. You can get back to our collections and get that data. You can look at old collections and, and show how species have changed. You know, the genetic composition of a species within this country has changed a lot because of the changing populations of their host of these changing populations of insects have produced genetic bottlenecks. Um, and we're get, we've got an exciting project now using these genomes, which comes back to why, why are we using genomes? Why are we using Partly, we're looking at one of the great reasons for sequencing genomes of UK insects means that we can go back to these old collections. We've got a nice genome now. It's like a, it's a scaffold. This genome shows you where all the, in the, yeah, so in the, the collection at the museum, at Oxford, at Cambridge, all these amazing insect collections, all, their, all these specimens still have DNA in them, but it may be incredibly fragmented into tiny little sections. If you've got a genome of that species, you can go back to that DNA in the insect collection. There's a little bit of frag, those little fragments, and you can you can assemble them where they should be on the genome, and you can start to assemble. You can get these little bits of DNA and assign them to genes, and you can actually start to look. In in the best cases, you can look at how the, the genetic makeup of a species has changed in Britain over the years, over the decades, or over the centuries. I've got small ranunculus in here. It's a little moth. Again, you know, it's collected in my garden. It'll, it'll produce the genome. Um, and this is a species that's had a really interesting history in Britain of extinction and then recolonization. And now its population is increasing a lot. But is this now a new increase? Uh, is this now a new population that's come over? Are they, is the genetic makeup quite different from the old population that went extinct when lettuce farming became less big business and at the end of the 19th century? We've got so we're going to do a colleague at the museum, Ian Barnes, he's going to be looking at 20 different insect species potentially and seeing how we can use the, the genomes to look and our collections at the museum to look at how these things have changed, how they've adapted, potentially adapt, adapted to change in the environment, which is really important. Um, going back to those hornets, there's now a genome. Can we go back to the collection of hornets and see, do we now have different sort of cohorts, different genetic, uh, are, did, different hornet populations come over from the continent or have did our hornet uh, never change? Have we in fact lost loads of genetic diversity when they went through those population declines? It'd be really cool. Uh, but yeah, that's just some of the uses. So that's a real quick whiz through genomes, essentially. And just like the rest of our collections, you know, the Natural History Museum collections have been built up by a huge number of people over a huge length of time. You know, this is a new sort of collection, this genomic collection, but again, it relies on a vast band of people who know what they're doing and devote a huge amount of time and expertise to building up this resource. Uh, so this legacy will go on for a long time. 
and I'm incredibly grateful for all the people who give their time and their expertise and hopefully will continue to do so into the future and we'll try and demonstrate just what we can do with these genomes and how they can help understand uh, changing sort of UK fauna and flora over time and I'd particularly like to thank obviously um, it goes without saying all this work comes about through a team of also through a team of dedicated people that we've employed to do this work it's it's quite uh, a lot of effort to go to process thousands of specimens and record where they are in the world which freezer rack they're in where you know what this dna um, is encoding for and it's yeah it's a great fun project to work on and it's been fantastic to work go out to the field with loads of great collectors and i'll probably stop there because i think that's half an hour pretty much or slightly more <laughs>